Okay. Again, let's go before the throne of grace. Lord, because we must. When we come before your throne of grace, we're acknowledging that we can't figure this out on our own, Lord. We can't implement it. We can't live it without your power. But Lord, those are the things we want. We want to put your word into practice. We want to use your word for all it's worth. The depth of your word. But we need your spirit to teach us, to remind us, to strengthen us, to give us ears to hear, ears trained to obedience, to hear the word of God and implement it in our lives. So dear Holy Spirit, we ask you to open the doors of our hearts in case we're having some trouble opening them to you. Lord, just a finger hold is all you need and you'll make sure that door is opened. We can receive by faith the word of the living God. So we thank you for your presence. We thank you for your teaching. We thank you for your anointing. We thank you for giving us ears to hear and the faith to live what we hear. In Jesus' name, amen. In these last two pages that you're getting, this is a wrap-up now of 2 Corinthians. Encouraging you always to read your Bible. We picked what we thought were more foundational passages that we could look at that stand alone, and yet they still combine to make a point. And uh, we'll work through, the, by God's grace, the end of this. We begin with 2 Corinthians 10.3. says, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Although we live in the flesh, we do not fight according to the flesh. We don't fight the way carnal people fight. So often, this isn't always our first response. When I was looking at my notes on this, the Lord was saying to me, never thought of it this way, that Christians are first responders. All Christians are first responders. We hear on the television set that if there's an earthquake and people are hurt, no matter where in the world, we respond in prayer. We hear an ambulance go down the street or we see a fire truck go by or a police car go by, we begin immediately to pray. Pray that God will be there. Pray that God will help those first responders. Pray that God will be in that situation. When we see a hearse and a, what do you call it, a, just a, a line of cars going to the cemetery, we stop for a moment, we pray for those families that they'll know the grace and peace of God. And God God will use that for his glory. We're first responders, but too often as first responders, we don't respond in the spirit, but we respond in the flesh. We all have done that. so easy to do that. We respond in the flesh instead in the spirit, and often we fire at the wrong enemy. When we aim at flesh and blood, we're, we're firing at the wrong enemy, and the Holy Spirit needs to come near us. He comes close to us and he whispers in our ear that we should set our sights a little higher because the enemy isn't in this plane. The enemy is in a higher plane. He's in a second heaven. And he directs us to make sure that our firepower and our response is going in the right direction. I think that's a sign of Christian maturity is as we get older, we find out how to respond. And our tendency when we're immature is to respond in the flesh rather than to respond in the, in, the, in the warfare of the Spirit. But we learn and we grow. We begin to understand who the enemy is. Long time ago, there was a missionary visiting somewhere around here. And someone that had attended one of his services said that he made this statement, and it always stuck with me, that if it bleeds, it's not the enemy. Say that again, if it bleeds, it's not the enemy. And so often we forget that. So often our first response is to go after flesh and blood rather than go after the spiritual forces that are at work behind it. Not that we enter into that second heaven, but our prayers do. It's not where we do our warfare, believe it or not. We, I shouldn't say that. We direct our warfare at it. But what I wanted to say is, is that it's not for us to go into the second heaven. It is for the angels of God to go. It is 
for us to pray the Word of God and let God send. Let the, let the battle be the Lord's and let Him bring it into that second heaven where the battles take place. We target... I always thought it was interesting during the Gulf War when this technology was rather new that you had people that would go out and they would use lasers and they would focus it on a target and then a smart bomb would fall and, and just destroy that, that one single target without collateral damage as much as possible. Christians are like that. We focus in prayer. We focus in the Word. We focus on the enemy, the real enemy, and we call in the warfare of God, the army of God to do the work. So in true, truthfully, although we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. If you war according to the flesh, you're never going to win. We've all, I think, learned that and experienced that. It's a, it's a useless battle. But then Paul goes on to say in the next verse, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. The weapons of our warfare are not fleshly, not carnal, but they're mighty in God. The dynamis power of God, the miracle, miraculous working power of God for the pulling down of strongholds. These next three or four verses are really based on Paul. You know, it's, it's rather sad when you read 2 Corinthians and you're coming to the end of it like we are. And of course, needless to say, I've left many verses out. We, should, we could have read all of them. But I've tried to pick these key verses. But what you come to find out is that this church in Corinth that Paul started, that Paul poured his life into, poured his heart into, poured his prayers into, poured his faith into, has really turned from him. They are looking now at other teachers, and they have said that Paul, that they've outgrown Paul. I remember something that Ben Yoder told me a long time ago. And it always stuck with me, and I don't know if you've ever considered it. He was talking about Samson. And if you will look at a child's Bible or, you know, just any, any painting that's been done of Samson, you always see him as kind of a young Arnold Schwarzenegger, you know, rippling with muscles and, you know, the, the strength of Samson, and everybody was astounded at his strength. And Ben made a point to me. He said, Skip, he said, did you ever realize that Samson probably looked like an ordinary man? Because this is why they kept saying, where does he get his strength? If he looked like Schwarzenegger, they'd say, oh, yeah, he's got all this strength. You know, he's a, he works out, he's, he's developed all his muscles and everything else. And I never thought about that, that it, it just would have looked like a normal human being. And so everybody would say, you know, how could he take the doors of the city and can carry them out into the desert? How could he slew, you know, slay so many of the enemy with the jawbone of an ass? How was he able to do these things? Because, and the reason they asked it is because looking at him, you couldn't tell that he's the kind of guy that could do that. That was something on the inside. It was God on the inside. It was the anointing on the inside. And you couldn't look at the outside. You couldn't judge him by external things. And I never had thought about that. Well, this is the same case with Paul. You know, I, I don't know what you picture of Paul. This, this great hero of the New Testament, this man who went through so much. You know, I know one thing. If I'm in heaven and Paul walks in the room, I'm walking out because I don't deserve to be in the same room as this man. Any man that could go through what he went through and, and stay with the calmness and the peace and the de dedication to the Lord, knowing that whether he served God on earth or served God in heaven, he had only one aim, and that was to be pleasing to God. But I think we need to take into consideration that Paul, you know, I don't know how you picture Paul, but let me tell you how most historians picture Paul. Middle-aged man, probably not very tall, balding, very nearsighted, could hardly see, and not a great speaker. He had no qualifications to be the Paul that most of us think that he is. And so when he goes to Corinth, this is a church... The, the, the one thing you always want to remember when you read anything in Corinthians, 1st or 2nd Corinthians, it deals with the issue of pride that is in that city. That city was always trouble. We find out later in the writings of the early church fathers that went the next generation of, of leaders in the church, they had problems with Corinth. Corinth was just a problem church, and most of the problem was pride. It was a big uh, trading city. It was a city of much wealth. It was a fantastic city in that day and age. It was kind of a wonder of the world. And they brought that pride that they had even through their conversion. They brought that pride into the church. And so they said, we don't need Paul. We don't need Paul anymore. We, we'd rather have some handsome man here that's 
been trained by the orators that is a good speaker and makes a good appearance and doesn't have eye problems and doesn't have to have a scribe write his stuff for him and everything. We, 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 want, we want to bring people into the church that are the Paul that we wish he would be. And you, had, you know that had to hurt Paul's feelings. You had to know that. And, you know, and he, he's got to deal with the pride here. I, I don't know that he would actually have been bothered that much by himself, but he just couldn't let that pride. He, he knew with that kind of pride the church was never going to amount to all that it should be. And so a lot of the warfare that we're talking about here is actually Paul talking about the church at Corinth. And, and even though there is spiritual warfare there, uh, he's really talking, you know, we, you would think he's talking to the unbelievers, but he's really talking to the believers. And I think how hurt he would have to be because they're bringing in teachers to replace him. And you've got to remember, though, Paul is like Samson. The strength is on the inside. It's not what you see. And you, you have Paul saying, and he actually says this. He says, do I need to come there? I remember years ago when Sue and I were in Texas visiting my sister in Dallas and her family. There was a billboard on the side of the highway. It's the only place I ever saw it. Maybe you've seen it other places. This is some years ago when these billboards were somewhat around. And it just simply was God speaking on this billboard and says, don't make me come down there. Remember that? Don't make me come down there. I love that. I love that. We ought to be putting those signs back up. Don't make me come down there. This is what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth. He said, I, I'd like to just love you. I would just like to compliment you. I would just like to, to visit you in joy. He said, but if you don't stop this, he says, must, must I come in the power of the apostolic calling of Christ? And then you will really see who Paul is. So, wow. 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 Makes the book of Cor the Corinthian letters come alive when you understand what Paul's saying. This is why they were, when Samuel came to a city, and they, the same thing, when, when he wasn't there, you could talk about Samuel, you could kind of make fun of Samuel, this furry, hairy old man, you know, and says he speaks for the Lord, and now he's not here, so we're going to do our thing, and then all of a sudden, they see him approaching, he's approaching the city, and the people start getting scared, is it Samuel, is it Samuel, does he look like he's heading in our direction, is he coming here, and then they ask the question, is he on a horse, or is he on a mule? Because if he was on a horse, he'd come in warfare. If he'd come on a mule, he came in peace. And this, this is the way it was with Paul. Paul didn't want to interfere in their lives. Paul didn't want to boast about himself. But he wasn't going to let him get off track. And he said, do I need to come there? Boy, don't you wish you had that in a church today? For the person to say, do I, you know, do I need to come there? Like God, you know, don't make me come down there. That's exactly what Paul was saying. Don't make me come. Don't make me come in my apostolic authority. I, I, Paul knew his apostolic authority, but I'm impressed by the fact that Paul was never taken by power. You know, they say absolute power uh, corrupts absolutely. You know, Paul had great power. And he had great authority that was given to him by God. He was in that first go, first, you know, first uh, uh, band of apostolics. Uh, the, the original apostles, and he, they were endued with great power from on high. And uh, Paul didn't like to throw his weight around, and I appreciate that he was a humble man. But when it came to preserving the truth of God in the church, if Paul had to throw his weight around, he would throw his weight around. You know, the, I told you a long time ago the story of the old church that my family used to go to down in the city of St. Louis back, back when in the early 50s in the later 50s and early 60s before they built out in the county in St. Louis. And it uh, was an alleyway behind the church. And they were doing construction on a house next to the church or a building, whatever it was. And they had a sign put up that said danger because they knew people, they wanted people to know that they were going into a construction zone, that they needed hard hats on and different things. And so one of the drivers, there was a truck, probably a cement truck or something, coming up to the sign. And so he moved it, but instead of putting it under the house of his construction, he took the sign and moved it over in the alleyway by the church. And so here you were passing by the church, and there's a sign outside the church that says, Danger Zone. And I remember the pastor preaching on that, and he said, you know, that was absolutely right. He said, to those who are mocking God and making fun of God or just using God, the church is a dangerous place to be. 
know that God is not mocked. Amen? A lot of that going on today. And so, you know, if you're, if you're around people that are deeply, deeply spiritual people in God, I mean, genuine thing, it is a blessing and it also is a fearful thing. I think so. Did you ever think that somebody, I remember years ago when I was first starting out and had a lot of things to clean up in my life, and I can remember meeting these, some of these people and I thought, oh my gosh, they're going to know everything I've done. They're going to, you know, uh, there, there was actually a fear of being around these people, you know. And uh, uh, I, I, I just see this with Paul. Because he's, he, when he says the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, he's referring to the church. We think we're talking about outside the church and unbelievers and the unbelieving system, and that's all true. But in this case, these next couple verses here are all about Paul talking to the church. So it's to the church, he says. He says, for the weapons of our warfare. He says, I want you to know, church, I'm not playing games. If I have to use the weapons of our warfare, they are mighty in God. And they will pull down strongholds. And they will cast down arguments. He says in the next one, casting down arguments, pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. He is speaking to the church. That's the, mem- that's the little note I'd make sure to put on my notes there as you go back and review these in, in future times. As we've come up with these now almost 29 pages, whatever it is, 29 pages or so of, of commentary on these books of the Bible. That he is talking to the church, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but are mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds. These people are lost in pride, and Paul's going to chop them off at the knees and for their own sake bring them back to humility, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. That, that, and and I, I, when I look at that, and I realize that this is the power of God This power of God is to be used both in the church and outside of the church. We want to tear down every high thought that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Not only theirs, but our own. I want every thought I think I want every thought I think, that's a hard way to say that, but I want every thought that I think to be in obedience to Christ. All I want as I get older and I reach towards the end of my life is I just want to be more and more obedient all the time. Like Paul, I want to say we've made it our aim to be pleasing to Him, whether we're here or whether we're there. I like the fact of knowing that as I bow my knee before Christ here, I will still bow my knee at Him as my Master and me as His bond slave even in heaven. And our whole purpose will be to please Him. Our whole purpose will be to please Him. I had an illumination that I'm not even, well, I shouldn't even call it that because I'm not sure I'm right. But it sure is something to think about. One scripture that constantly goes through my mind is the scripture that says that Jesus, or that God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. God was in Christ Jesus, reconciling the world to himself. We were talking earlier this morning, some of us, about the movie that was based on the book, The Shack. Probably most of you have seen it. If you haven't, you should should rent it someplace, or buy it, or get it somehow. But if you remember that there was a, a moment in that story, where the man who was trying to overcome the death of his daughter in this weekend getaway with God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and that God presents himself as a, a rather large black woman, re- reveals himself to him that way because he had had a lot of problem with a very uh, bad relationship with his own earthly father. And so God appears to him as a woman instead of a man, though God has all those attributes anyway. And he said, I appeared to you like this because I knew the problem you had with your father and I didn't want you to think that of me. But anyway, he go, she's cooking in the kitchen. This might not make sense to you until you've read the book or seen the movie. But he goes in the kitchen and God is fixing supper. And the man is speaking to her. I can't remember exactly what caused the conversation. But he goes up to her and he takes her by the wrists. And he holds her hand and he's speaking to her and he looks down and he notices that her wrists are punctured like Christ's. 
and he turns it over and he looks again and seeing these marks of crucifixion on God and he says but I thought you abandoned him and she looks at him and she said I was always there and so I've thought Jesus said that he could do nothing without seeing the father do it first he said whatever I say is what God said he said whatever I do is what I do what is what he's told me to do he said, I do, I do what he shows me to do. I wonder in his own spirit, did Jesus see his father on the cross? That's not as far-fetched as it sounds. Not as far-fetched as it sounds. God was in Christ Jesus. I could just cry about this. Reconciling the world to himself. What a God. What a God. So Paul says that we, in our warfare, and I missed something I wanted to share with you on that first note. When we talked about being first responders for God. We so often don't respond in the Spirit, but we should, resp- we should respond this way. I think we should respond I'm going to try and f- hang on. I still don't leave enough room to print large enough for me to see. First response should always be, I, I look at it this way, I think our first response, as first responders, as Christians, we should first, it should be faith. We should make sure that our faith is activated, that we're walking in faith, because to pray without faith will get us nothing. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Everything starts with faith. Then there is the Word of God, and then there is prayer. That's how I think we as first responders to any problem, to any issue, to anything in life that needs prayer, we should come in faith, we should come in the Word of God, and then we should come in prayer. And I believe it's that order, again, faith being first, then the Word of God, and then prayer, because if we don't put the Word of God next, then we're going to pray our opinion rather than the Word of God. And God doesn't watch over my opinion to perform it, He watches over His Word to perform it. Well, if there's anything I learned coming out of the church I was raised in was how to pray by faith, was to pray the scriptures. We kind of always prayed what we thought, what we think. Boy, that's a dangerous territory to be in. But instead, we will pray with the word of God, knowing that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus. Why would we not pray the word of God? So we respond in faith, we respond in the word, we respond, we respond in prayer. Paul goes on again to talk about these people that have rebelled against him, that have hurt him, that have ceased to love him, ceased to respect him, and they're bringing in all these new teachers. And he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 12, and 18, he says, For we dare, bold talk, for we dare not class ourselves, we do not count ourselves, or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. For we do not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. We're not going to, be, we're not going to join ourselves to the people who recommend themselves. What does that mean to recommend themselves? He says, but they, strong words, but they measuring themselves by themselves. And why is it so dangerous for us to do a self-analysis? Why does the Bible teach us to say, you, O God, search me? Because the Bible also makes it clear that every man thinks he's right in his own eyes. All of us are guilty of that. I don't want to analyze myself. When I pray, I pray for for forgiveness for the sins I know, but I also pray for the sins that I don't know. Lord, forgive me for what I have committed and what I have failed to commit. Forgive me for what I know that I've done and forgive me what I don't even know. I'm not even aware that I have done that has grieved you. And Paul says, I'm not going to put myself with those people because this is what they were doing. They were comparing themselves to each other. 
And, they were, and factions were coming out of that. Remember when he said, they said, well, one says, I'm of, a, I'm of, I'm of Paul. Another one says, I'm of Apollos. And they started factor, uh, fracturing into groups. And this disunity was coming into the church. And if there was anything that Paul knew, was that disunity would ruin a church. You've got to stay of one mind and of one, one belief and of one heart. Brethren dwelling together in unity. So he really cuts them off at the knees here. He says, for we dare not classify ourselves, class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. Strong, strong words. And you know who else those words are directed to? That 92% of people who answered the survey of why they were going to heaven because we've tried to do good. They have measured themselves against others. They have measured themselves against their own standard. And they said, my measurement is good, my measurement is correct, and my measurement is that I will go to heaven. Paul says that those who do that are not wise. For not he who commends himself is approved, but whom the Lord commends. Strong, strong words. You have to wonder, how is this hitting the people in Corinth? Because they're not even hearing Paul say this. He's writing this, and somebody will speak this when that message is delivered to Corinth. And you you hope it has the, the powerful impact in the spirit that it does when Paul writes this. And then he, then, then he can't help but show his love for them in the next verse, 2 Corinthians eleven two, He says, for I am jealous for you with godly jealousy. You might sit there and say, well, all jealousy is wrong. No, it's not. God himself said, I am the Lord thy God. I am a jealous God. God is jealous of his bride. God is jealous of his bride who is Israel and Christ's bride who is the church. He's a jealous God. Look at what he says here. For I have betrothed you. I have engaged you. I have married you to one husband. Paul knew what he taught in Corinth for two years. He knows the foundation he laid in Christ. He knows what he's doing. He's not one who wonders, am I, am I doing this right or am I doing this wrong? Am I, am I accomplishing anything? He knows what he accomplished. He knows what he's done in Christ. He won't brag on anything he's done without the power of God. He says, for I have married you to one husband. What a powerful thing to say. I live with this. I'm, I'm trying desperately to marry many of these prisoners to Christ, to one person. I hope you guys appreciate it. I know you, I can't possibly begin to tell you everything that goes on out there. For I have betrothed you to one husband that I may present you a chaste version to Christ. I know what that feels like. When these guys tell me, oh, there's a new Bible study starting on Thursday night. There's somebody coming in with a new Bible study. I don't immediately say, whoopee, I'm glad. First I want to know is, will they be good or will they harm my kids? You do become jealous. I'm jealous of you. But you have the maturity here in this church you know, you're not going, you know, there are, there are walls in that prison by the doors, the, the incoming doors. There are, there are plastic, like you've seen where you can put magazines in. There's just row after row after row, and there's Wicca, and there's Islam, and there's this, and there's that, and there's Native American studies, and all these other things. And I see some of these young guys go in there, and they're so hungry for God, they're just taking one of everything, one of everything, one of everything, one of everything. At one point, they told me there was at least 15 Bible studies going on in that prison at one time. And you know what? If they're teaching the truth of God, praise God for it. As Colson said, the next great revival will probably come out of our prisons. These guys are devoted. I'll tell you what, you would be surprised to talk to these men. They're, they're talking, they're, you know, they, they talk about things in the ancient Greek and the ancient this and the ancient that. And historic, the, many of them are on college courses right now. Many, because now you can go to college on the internet, many of them are taking college courses. And, you know, and, and because I've just now probably put in, what, six, seven years of my life out there. And with a lot of these men now, we've just finished the first year of that Monday night teaching. We just finished Romans. It took us a year to get through it. But we finally finished it. And I'm jealous for these guys. I'm jealous about them. You know, I want them to, I want them to know Christ in purity. I want their... I, 
You know, and like Paul, I think I can honestly say, I know the theology I'm teaching them is right. I've made a lot of mistakes in my life. Guys, I'll be the first to admit it, but I have never played games with the Word of God. I'm too scared to do it. I mean that with all my heart. And you can accuse me of a lot of things, and I could confess a lot of things, but I'll tell you what, one thing I will stand pat on is you do not play games with the Word of God, and don't think I don't drill that into them when they're getting up and preaching to others, that it's not about them, and you don't. You can play games with a lot of things, but you don't play games with people's spirituality. Somebody say amen. Amen. So let's go to our last page now. One thing that's interesting, I think, in this next verse, let's just read this next verse and then we'll talk about it for a moment. 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. Again, he's talking about these. See, as far as Paul was concerned, when they were bringing these false teachers in, Paul was, Paul, to, in Paul's mind, they were committing adultery. Not against him, but against Christ. He takes that absolutely seriously. He says they are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. What I think is interesting, you know, many people take a stand that there is no prophetic office today. Yet, when the prophetic office is declared as a gift by the risen Christ to the church, in Ephesians chapter 4, it says, when he ascended, he gave gifts to the church, among which are apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists, until we come to the full stature of Christ, until the church comes to maturity. And there's no way we can say the church has reached maturity and the full stature of Christ. But, but we have blocked off the apostles because we don't understand that there is a difference between the original 12 and the fulfilling of that office, uh, just like for the, pro, for, for the present day prophet and evangelist and so on. And this points this out in this first sentence. He says, for they are false apostles, deceitful workers, transferring themselves into apostles of Christ. If there was a general understanding that the only apostles, and this is the, uh, the, 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 uh, the ground on which many churches rest, they say that there was only those original 12, and after that the apostolic office ended. Part of the reason they say that is because the apostles were the authors, many of the apostles were the authors of the Word. And they're afraid if that you acknowledge that an apostle today, you would be giving him license and authority to add or detract from the Word of God, which is not what we're talking about at all. But my point is, he says, transforming them into apostles. You know, the, if, there, if there was a belief that there was only the 12 apostles, this sentence never would have been written. Everybody would have known who the 12 were. They were known. Which means that if Satan was going to transform himself into an apostle, he'd have had to transfer himself into a Matthew and a Mark or a Luke or a John. Because those were the only apostles, but they weren't. They were taking on this, this office. And the office of the apostle has always been what it's been, which is to lay the apostolic foundation of Christ. Paul said, as a wise master builder, I have laid a foundation. That's what apostles do. They lay a foundation. I asked the question as we were wrapping up Romans at the prison. Paul said that he was coming to Rome because there was no longer a place for him where he was. There was no longer room for him. And he said, I will not preach and I will not build on another man's foundation. And I asked them, why? Why did Paul say that he would not build on another man's foundation? And I started getting answers like, well, maybe he was too concerned, you know, that maybe the, the apostolic foundation wasn't right and he'd be held responsible for it. I think that misses it. Do you know what I think Paul was saying? I think he was saying that he was going to be true to his anointing. Paul was not there to build churches. He was there to lay the foundations for churches for others to build on. And I told them, because many of these men believe they're going to go into ministry when they get out of prison. 
And I told them, I said, never. I said, I, I, I phrased it this way. I said, always, always be faithful to your anointing. Always be faithful to your anointing. An evangelist doesn't make a good pastor. A pastor doesn't necessarily make a good prophet. A prophet doesn't make an apostle. These are individual and distinct gifts, not from the Holy Spirit, from, but from Christ to the church. And you have to be true to your anointing. And Paul was true to his anointing. And so he, would, he fulfilled the apostolic, the apostolic office. And I think it's interesting, it says, for Satan himself transfers himself into an angel of light. We all know that, but he references it here to the fact, therefore it is no great thing. Today we'd say, no big whoop. No big whoop if his ministers, are, notice it says it's they're his ministers. Hard to believe there are ministers in the church of the living God who belong to Satan. It's exactly what Paul's saying. For Satan himself transforms himself in an angel of life. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness whose end will be according to their works. So what Paul's saying is, if not now, there is a day coming when they will pay high, a high price for what they're doing. Last three verses that we're looking at. He says, The Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. See, they were saying, well, Paul's a weak man. And they were accusing. This is a really the big thing. And I hadn't said it up till now. But one of the other issues are is that Paul, they, they believe that, that Paul was walking in the flesh. Paul was being led by his own flesh, being led of, of the flesh and not, not walking in the spirit. And Paul said, yes, I may be humble looking. I don't cut a big figure. I may be a middle-aged man, balding, bent over from all the things that I've gone through. My body racked by so many of the things, carrying the scars of Christ. I don't present a pretty picture. And yes, I have issues. But he, this again, he is saying to the church, he says that the Lord, when he asked him to remove the thorn from his side, three times and the Lord said, my grace is sufficient. The word contentment is involved in that for you. For my strength is made perfect. That is the word complete in the, in the Greek. My strength is made complete in weakness. Then he says in this amazing statement, therefore most gladly I will rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ might rest on me. Wow. That rest on me, it comes from a Greek word that is familiar to Paul because it, it means to, to pitch a tent, is literally what it says. That when I boast on my infirmities, I won't boast on my strength, I'll boast on my infirmities, because when I boast on my infirmities, the Lord camps out on me with his strength. Wow. So I've learned for all our sometimes wrong approaches to faith, charismatic faith, I've learned to be able to say, Lord, there's some things that I just can't handle. Can't handle it. And you know what's great about that? Christ will come and camp on that. I would rather boast in my infirmities. What a saying. Remember when we went through that time where everybody had to have a smile on their face and everybody had to be happy because if you weren't, you didn't have enough faith. I remember those days. Still remember going to a pastor's conference in New Orleans and the sun beating off the front of the vehicle. Had a pounding headache by the time we got to a rest stop and went and bought a little tin of some aspirins to take for a pounding headache. And I remember one of the guys we were riding with came up to me. He came around the corner while I was buying that thing. He says, what's wrong with you? Don't you have enough faith? I thought, well, I'm glad those days are over. Paul says, 2 Corinthians 12.10. 
He says, therefore, I look at this. I can't get over it. I'll never get used to what the Bible says. I don't want to. I want to be astounded all the time. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. The, the New American Standard said, I am well content in my infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distress, for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Wow. Will we remember that? Or is this a verse that you'll forget? Or is this part of your foundation now? Part of your foundation. That we will take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in needs, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake. Why? Because that when I'm weak, then I am strong. And finally, I thought this was the best verse to end Corinthians with. Verse 5 of chapter 13. Examine yourself as to whether you are in the faith. Again, he's writing to the church. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Do you not know? It's interesting, there are two specific words for know in the Greek. There is one word, know, that comes, knowledge that comes from experience. That is not what this is talking about. This is a Greek word that is knowledge that comes by intuition. Do you not know that Jesus Christ is in you? I don't know that a lot of Christians really fully understand that. Do you not know that Christ lives in you, Christ is in you? Intuitive knowledge is maybe best said this way. Whatever you thought of Oral Roberts when he was alive, he did say this. He said, son, there are some things that you just know that you know that you know that you know. That's really kind of what the word is here. Do you not know that Christ is in you? Because that changes everything. Amen? It is 10 minutes till. If, would you mind if I read you an article? I don't really like to do it. Can I read this article? To you? It's about fear and faith. And I hope maybe somebody would get something out of this. Only take a few minutes to read this. The name of the article is Letting Trust Burn Bright. Written by a woman named Shannon Evans. She says this, Don't worry. Have you ever balked at these words? Maybe a well-meaning friend or a slightly exasperated spouse has said this and to, placa to placate your fears. Truthfully, it's exactly what I need to hear and do. It's exactly what I need to hear and do when I'm in the middle of a worry party. But my default reaction is to stiff arm the speaker and pull my worries even closer. How dare that person try to fix my problem with a platitude? Don't they realize don't worry is easy to say, yet hard to do? When I'm in the trenches of anxiety, that phrase dumps like gasoline on an already crackling fire. What's fueling this fire anyway? For me, worry appears when circumstances spin out of my control. When my toddler has woken three times in the night, I'm tense as I wait for him to cry out again, dreading how tired I'll be and feel tomorrow. Or when my five-year-old struggles with his own anxiety, instead of praying for him to have peace in the moment, I worry that his ten tendencies might affect all his future relationships. When a child gets sick, I fret about canceled plans and, and who will be ill next. Worry has an older, more serious cousin, fear. Your stomach drops and your heart pounds. Fear can become full-blown panic, like when my toddler's last virus sent him to the ER with breathing problems. This kind of fear doesn't just come for tea. It, comes, it lives in the spare room. It arrives, with what, it arrives with that harrowing diagnosis 
or when the phone rings with awful news. It lives in countries devastated by war where people's homes and lives are blown apart. We all know that what we fear most, even if we hadn't experienced it, the situation so terrible to contemplate that we block ourselves behind a mental door and we can't even think about opening. Fear can explode in big ways or it might thread itself through everyday thoughts until we claim it as part of our identity, our natural bent. I'm just a worrier. But festering worry or rooted fear is not simply a personality test result. There's a deeper problem at work. A quick caveat, I believe body, soul, and mind are not easily separated. In some cases, people are clinically diagnosed with anxiety, struggle with panic attacks or battle depression. In these situations, I'm grateful for God's provision of medicine and professional help. Jesus himself told us not to worry. He said to his followers more directly, do not fear. This might seem like an unattainable demand, but what if instead we saw this like the hand beckoning us like a hand beckoning us up close. Not just to come near to peace, but to examine our core beliefs about God's character, His heart towards us, and who we are in Him. Who is He? Who is God? Pastor and author A.W. Tozer once wrote, What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. I'll say that again. What comes into our minds when we think about God is the most important thing about us. This reminds us when Jesus asked his disciples, who do you say that I am? Although he was referring to his identity as a Messiah, the question is crucial for us as we contemplate fear. Who is God and what is he like? How I answer those questions sheds light on fear's place in my life. Does worry override my trust in him? In the midst of difficulty, I'll often pray, Lord, change my circumstances and then I'll trust you. I'll happily give up my anxiety once he removes the reason that I am anxious. My trust in him is based on what what is going on around me, not on who he is. How often is that the truth? Lord, as soon as you get rid of the problem, then I'll believe you to get rid of the problem. I'm reminded of three people in the Bible whose trust in God did not come with conditions. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Facing a fiery death for refusing to worship a Babylonian idol answering the king who seemed to hold their lives in their hands. If this be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning furnace, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But if not, be it known to you, O king, that we will not serve your gods or worship the golden image that you have set up. Their emotion is not explicit, but the king's fury and the fire's heat must have been terrifying. Perhaps beneath their bold words ran panic thoughts. Does anybody want to burn to death? They know God could deliver them, but their trust in him didn't depend on a rescue. And in that awful moment, they let the fear point them to who God is, one who is able to save. They believed and proclaimed this, even though he might let them die. In my own life, do I believe God is in control? Do I trust his heart towards me is good? The truth is, I can't give both fear and God's sovereignty a seat at my table. I can't see his goodness if unbelief darkens my vision or if worry rules my heart. I want to be able to answer the question, who do you say that I am, with the same words those men did, the one who is able to save. Imagine Shadrach, Meshach, and again Bendigo's thoughts when the soldiers hauled them closer to the fire, when it seemed like God's answer was no. Didn't he see what was happening to them? Where was he? Our worst fears might come true too, and we've got to wrestle with God's no. People aren't always healed of cancer or rescued from the horrors of war. Our spouses lose their jobs. A heart attack steals a loved one way too soon. Toddlers who should be clambering around the playground instead lying in a hospital waiting for a heart transplant. How can fear not reign when death and pain surround us when our prayers seem to fall fall unheard? Where is God in these things? And what what is he thinking when he tells us no to fear, tells us not to fear? The Bible says God protects, heals, and restores. But I see death and cancer and war. I see broken relationships and broken hearts. I see three Hebrew exiles slung into a furnace. It seems that the pagan king has won. Or maybe I'm not seeing the end of the story. Maybe right now, like these condemned men, all we see is the fire. But soon, like them, we'll see that not only is God aware of our fiery trial, 
He's right there in it with us. And one day sin and death and unfathomable pain like that pagan king will bow their knees to the one who has never left us in the face of our fears alone. Whether we're treading water in anxiety or drowning in our own worst fears, we must remind ourselves of where of of, of we must remind ourselves of where he is with us. Always we can and should repeat, repeat truths of his sovereignty and goodness. But clinging to his ever present help in times of trouble gives us an antidote to fear. His presence with us is the difference between incineration and walking around unsinged, alive, and untainted by the smoke. The next question is, who am I? I'll tell you who I am not, one who's in control of everything. Isn't that often what causes anxiety and fear, our lack of control? We can't make that company hire us. We can't kill those cancer cells with positive thinking. And I was reminded very early in the emergency room that I didn't give birth to, I didn't give my child breath. I've never given him a single one of the thousand breaths he's taken in his young life. Shadrach, Meshach, and Amendigo knew this too. The only person seemingly in control of their situation was a volatile murderer riddled with pride and driven by rage. But did you notice that those five words these men uttered, hinting at something just as true, our God whom we serve. This is an identity statement. They knew who they were, servants of the living God, part of his chosen people. And because of Jesus, we follow him. We who follow him can claim the same. We can serve him in the midst of our fear because we are children of the living God welcomed into his family because of our older brother's sacrifice. I am his child, you're his child. Can we actually, actually grasp that? It's only since becoming a mother that I've been able to understand a fraction of such love, and it has changed my view of God and myself. If my fears lead me to believe God is indifferent, I only have to think about my own finite love for my children, and it destroys that liar quicker than those kids can destroy a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. And when he himself shows up in the middle of my nightmare, that glorious entwining of his sovereignty, goodness, and love can be a testimony to those who do not call him Lord. Like King Nebuchadnezzar said, astonished as he stared at the three very alive men, blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. In the Garden of Gethsemane that night before he died, Jesus faced his greatest agony. Soon he would bear the sin of the entire world and his beloved father would turn away. Jesus prayed, my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. The answer was no. And we are rescued because of it. What mercy is ours, what triumph, what eternal joy, because God's answer to Jesus' plea was no. And Jesus, went, Jesus willingly went through with it anyway. Does anyone understand unimaginable pain better than he does? Does anyone know better than Jesus what it means to trust God in the pain. What is Christ's encouragement to us then even as we battle fear and worry on this side of heaven? When he says, do not fear, he's bidding us to follow him into the rock-solid truth of his providence and care. Even if our worst fears happen, not only will he be there in the middle of it, he will one day bring us safely to his father's house where he is even now preparing a place. And who knows? Our faithful trusting response to hardship my crack open gospel truth for others like the splitting of a geode revealing its inner beauty. Fear cannot burn if something else burns in its place. My prayer is that we will let trust ignite our hearts fueled by the truth of his character. If fear is a dark cage, his inexhaustible love for us is a sun-drenched field. And he's there running ahead of us. Let's run after him, laying down our fear and taking up trust our steps light with courage for all that lies ahead. I thought that was a good word. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. There's something that is so clean and so cleansing as we come to your word. You said to your disciples that they were already clean because they'd been washed in the word. We took a bath together this morning, all of us, to learn to grow in grace. To know, Lord God, that we can trust you in all things. So we thank you, Lord. Thank you that you love us. Thank you that you care for us. Thank you that you take fear from our lives. That you build us up in the most holy faith. 
And Father, that you give us such a good and wonderful gospel. Lord, it's not like we have to go out and tell people hard things. They may need hard things at some point, but Lord God, we've got a gospel of love to tell people about for the God of love whom we worship and whom we serve. So we thank you. Lord, I ask your blessings upon everyone as we leave this place today. May your blessings go with us as we go home and into our families and enter into our homes. And Lord God, may we dedicate ourselves to a week, another week of serving you till we assemble again, asking you to make divine appointments where we can share this wonderful gospel and wonderful love of God. Lord, thank you. Thank you for this love story of the ages that you have brought into our lives. Now let us teach this story to others, not as a fairy tale, but as the greatest story ever told. Your love for your son and his bride and your people. We thank you for this, Lord. We thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your love. In Jesus' name, amen. Have a beautiful week, beloved.